Welcome everybody to today's webinar brought to you by Picus Security. Uh, my name is Simon, I'm part of the Picus team uh, and also the host of today's session. Um, today's session is all about defense evasion. Um, over the next hour or so, you can expect to learn about some of the tactics adversaries are using to evade detection by security controls. And we'll also be sharing some strategies that you can take away to help improve your defense. Joining me to discuss this topic and more, um, I'm delighted to be joined firstly by Crit Golden, um, Head of Solution Architects at Picus. Welcome, Crit. Good to see you. Good to see you, Simon. And also our special guest, um, John Hubbard, um, Senior Instructor at SANS. Thank you for taking the time to join us, John. Of course. I was excited to be here. As our guest, um, maybe you could just briefly start by uh, giving a, a bit about a bit about your background. Sure. So, uh, cyber defense is my love and kind of my wheelhouse in terms of what I teach for the Sands Institute. Uh, I've authored a couple courses on running security operations centers, both for analysts and for leadership. I also run a podcast called Blueprint, and I'm the cyber defense curriculum lead over at Sands. So, live and breathe this stuff, and love talking about it. No, like I say, it's, it's really good to, to have your expertise with us today, John. Um, so let's um, open up um, with just a brief introduction to today's uh, topic, which is defense evasion. Um, I'm sure a lot of our audience are familiar with MITRE and MITRE attack, uh, and might be aware that defense evasion um, is a tactic used by adversaries to evade um, security controls. Um, but what they might know is that the tactic itself is composed of 40 techniques and, and in excess of 150 sub-techniques, uh, making it one of the most prevalent tactics in attack. And, and for this reason, it's one of the most complex tactics for security teams to defend, defend against and really get their heads around. Um, so let, let's start, Crit. Um, we know that attackers don't want to get caught by defenders. Um, it's a pretty an obvious statement, but from, from an offensive point of view, can you really explain to us how this tactic of defense evasion helps adversaries to, to achieve their goals? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's certainly something we all should be pondering and thinking about how we defend against, right? I mean, the ultimate goal for a defender is to be stealthy and quiet. I would love to spend time in your environment and not ever be noticed. Right. And so really what we've seen over the last year is a significant rise in, in those techniques and tactics being used to do just that, to lay low on environment, not be discovered, disrupting organizations stealthily from the inside. If I can turn off your logs so you can't aggregate logs, coalesce and correlate into an alert, you're blind to my presence in your environment. If I can turn off your event logging, for example, disable a firewall, potentially disable an EDR tool, no better way to inhibit your ability to understand what I'm doing and how long I've been there than to have controls that aren't functioning properly. That's certainly a, 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 a new tech, not new at all by any means, but it's definitely on the rise. We've seen that more than sophisticated malware or techniques being used going back to impair defenses. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense from a defender's perspective. And think about the art of war. The goal is, is to, to weaken your defenses in your adversary. And then it makes it much easier to attack, much easier to stay stealthy, much easier to accomplish the objectives that you have in your environment. So we're seeing that rise significantly and we're seeing it be very successful. So we're, everybody looks for the latest and greatest piece of malware, or the latest capabilities or new techniques that are being developed perfecting some existing techniques and really honing in on impairing your defenses helps that attacker accomplish their objectives, whether that's exfiltrating data, whether that's elevating privileges. Um, if you're blind and you can't see it and you can't detect it and you can't aggregate it into an alert, then it's really hard to take action against it. So I, I think that's really why we're seeing that increase. I expect that to remain that way um, for the rest of the year and probably even increase into next year as well, Simon. John, Crit there was just talking about the need for visibility and, and given your black background in, in, in blue teaming, maybe you could just describe you know, how much pain um, defensive Asia causes um, security operations teams. 
Uh, short answer is quite a bit. Longer answer is it's one of the key capabilities to being able to even identify and start an incident, right? Um, we always talk about in class, uh, kind of an, as an intro topic, are defenders winning or are attackers winning? And, are, are, you know, what side is increasing at a faster rate? And, you know, we've seen some of these surveys come out recently that shows kind of defenders are picking up the speed at which we are able to detect our, our uh, environments are compromised. And one of the big reasons that we're able to do this, I believe, is endpoint visibility and controls, which is great when it works, <laughs> right? But if we have defensive evasion going on, and especially some of the types we're going to talk about today, uh, that kind of shortcuts the entire rest of all of the tooling and detection process that you've architected to try to deal with these problems. And so uh, it can be the one thing where if attackers can get this right, it's going to be like free and clear for them to continue the rest of the attack. So it can be one of the most uh, important things for, for blue teams to miss. To, ex to understand the extent to which um, attackers are using uh, defense evasion techniques, um, PICUS recently republished um, its annual red report, the, annual, uh, the PICUS red report 2024, which is an annual study of, of malware behaviors. Um, to compile the report um, this year, the team analyzed over 600,000 malware samples um, and they mapped the, the behaviors of the malware to the MITRE attack framework. And from there, they were able to identify the most common techniques that, that are being used. So let me just briefly take you through um, uh, some of the key findings of the report, because it, it kind of provides a bit more context to the, to the debate that we're having today. Um, one of the key findings, as you can see on screen now, is, is hundred well, is a 333% increase in what we term to be hunter killer malware. Um, so that's malware capable um, of defending, of evading defenses and directly impairing security controls um, to, to achieve their objectives, much in the way that um, hunter killer submarines operate in the depths of the ocean um, to evade uh, the adversaries and, and take out their targets. Um, a couple of supporting statistics around that. We found that around 70% of malware now employs stealth oriented tactics uh, and around a quarter is able to directly impair security controls like the ones we've been talking about, antivirus, SIM and, and, and EDR. Um, so um, defense evasion very much um, is, is on the rise. And that's something that we've seen over, over a number of, of years now. Um, Crit, but based on the findings of the Red Report, and um, perhaps you could just take a, a moment or two just to take us through some of the, the most common um, attack um, techniques that, 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 we, that we've been seeing. Love to do that. And, and really, that's a staggering number when you think about it. 25% of all malware today has stealth technology, has stealth capabilities. Um, that's a significant increase. What does that alone tell us? Kind of back to what I was saying earlier, um, new techniques, new sophisticated techniques or perfect techniques that actually pay dividends for the attacker. And that's really what we're seeing. They're doubling down on impairing defenses, right? Um, if I can, for example, disable or modify your tools, then I'm keeping you from having the proper detection and malware uh, um, detection capabilities to actually feed a SIM or feed a console or feed a dashboard for alerting for human activity. We see quite a few techniques that you see on the screen. The one that really, in my mind, is staggering and concerning is, is uh, T1562, the pair defenses. Um, we're seeing a significant increase in those techni techniques, capabilities, and we're seeing them be successful. Um, if I can, for example, disable Windows event logging, that significantly neuters what the SOC and SIM team, team can potentially see and, vi and have visibility into. If I can impair your command history logging, more importantly, modify or disable a firewall, uh, that's a sub-technique of impaired defenses. Disable or modify EDR tools, another sub-technique of defensive tools. Think about the, the consequences of that particular activity. Um, we often ask our security controls and security teams, 
do we have any activity, recent activity based on alerts, based on activity? If I don't have that visibility, if I'm not correlating logs, if I don't have an actionable alert that shows, what are we thinking in the organization? We're, we're doing pretty good. Things are okay. That's exactly where the attacker wants you to be. Understanding how they're impairing your defenses, how they're blocking logs, how they're blocking indicators, how they're modifying cloud logs. I could go down the list for the sub techniques for impair defenses. It's really critical when you think about it. So ultimately, we need to be aware of these techniques. Um, we need to be aware that they're on the rise, what groups are using them. And then more importantly, how do we stress test and, and, and ensure that that is not happening in our environment? Having a way to test our environment and really put it uh, um, put a stress test to it so we understand that it's functioning properly, logs are flowing as they should, and we're aggregating them into alerts that a human can do something with. Out of all of the techniques that you see on the screen, that's the one that probably has me the most concerned. Uh, um, obviously, credential dumping is always a concern, but if I can impair your defenses in any way, slow you down in any way to respond, maybe inhibit you completely from responding, I'm winning to John's point earlier, the defenders winning or the attackers winning. If attackers can successfully impair your defenses using those techniques, that's something certainly we need to be extremely concerned about and need to be on the lookout for. And, and that is uh, something that I know SOC teams are interested and concerned in. I know blue teams are also interested and concerned in in latest conversations with clients. John, how um, difficult or easy is it to, to actually detect some of these techniques like impaired defenses, like process injection, that are designed really to live off the land um, and hide in legitimate system processes? It very much depends on the maturity of the SOC team. Um, you know, when I teach, I see students from organizations all over the spectrum. Certainly some organizations can pull this off, but it takes a, a pretty high level of maturity. I would say the average organization is probably, depending on the tools they purchased, uh, not going to be super confident in picking up a lot of these things. And the reason for that is it's not just you can or you can't, it's kind of like one step. It's, there's a lot of things involved in getting this right. Uh, first, you have to just set up tools that can actually make this happen. You have to be able to purchase them, deploy them, uh, not just deploy them in some of your you know, estate, but really across everything because you never know where the attack is going to happen. Some organizations you know, will, will pay for maybe partial coverage or otherwise. And then assuming you even have the technology, uh, you have to have it collecting the right data. You have to configure it so that it can actually see these sorts of things. And if you don't know what to look for or how to configure it, you're either completely relying on the vendor to have done that for you, which they may or may not have, especially when it comes to customizing it for your environment. And if not, then you're, it's on you and you got to figure it out yourself. Uh, beyond that, you got to verify it can actually do these things, right? The vendor may say it can, they may have those things there, but have you tested it? Have you checked those things? Uh, a lot of teams maybe haven't even done that. And when it comes down to it, uh, they don't know if it will work or not. And then there's the question of over time, are those detections going to continue working? So there's really a lot of factors that goes into being able to even see this stuff and, and flag it in the first place. So yeah, the average team is is largely, I would say, struggling with this. Crit, um, I'll go back to the statistic around 70% of malware being able to exhibit stealth orientated um, te techniques. How much of a concern really is this? You know, these techniques now, they're not just being leveraged by advanced persistent threats, are, are they? You know, we've seen the trickle down and, and, and maybe more financially motivated actors are starting to leverage these techniques as well, right? So how much of a concern is that, that these techniques are being seen in, in, in different malware profiles? I think John really just kind of laid that out. It really depends on how sophisticated you are and depending on how sophisticated you are, that has a different impact on your environment. We're not seeing this being high level attackers anymore, or specific APT groups. These are common techniques. You, you know, it, on, on the dark web in the attacker community, they, they watch each other. They, they look at what is successful and what is not successful. They're certainly not afraid to mimic what other attackers are using. So we're starting to see these on the rise significantly. And if you have teams that aren't trained to understand how these techniques are being used or understand the impact of these um, techniques in your environment, then it could be catastrophic. I mean, uh, imagine relying 
some defensive organizations rely only on one or two layers. They're not mature enough to handle a full defense and depth stack. Maybe they're really relying on their EDR technology to be that last line of defense. Now with the 25% increase and not only the technique being used, you can extrapolate that out into a 25% increase of attackers are using these techniques. That's, that's more common in your environment. If you disable a particular technique, uh, excuse me, a particular tool in an environment, and especially in the, the environments that rely on that one defensive layer, um, they're in trouble, right, to be honest with you. So it really takes a full frontal approach, meaning I have to have defense and depth. Good old defense and depth never goes away, right? It's very critical because the likelihood of somebody disabling or impairing a firewall and an EDR and Windows event logs all at the same time are much less than just in a disabling or impairing an EDR tool. So it, it's critical today to be on the lookout for this. It's the lowest path, it's the least path of resistance for an attacker at this point. Developing new techniques, new tactics, new sophisticated uh, pieces of malware or using existing techniques to continue to impair defenses, I would choose to impair defenses. I'd rather you be blind and me take an easier approach than a more sophisticated approach and you not be blind. So it's something all shops should be concerned about. Attackers are always going to look for the easiest path into your environment and the easiest path to success. What we're seeing today is impairing defenses. It is, I won't say easy, but it's not impossible. And it's certainly being successful. We would not see a rise in it if there wasn't success out in the attacker community. So again, back to understanding your defense in depth, understanding how to stress test that environment and ensure that you're aware of those techniques and capabilities being available in your environment and defending against them is critical today, especially for your uh, small enterprise SMB organizations that have a limited staff and competing priorities. Um, they're taking advantage of that today. They know the economic times are tough. They know that we don't have the, uh, uh, the staff that we would love to have in cybersecurity. We never have. We've always wanted more analysts, more capabilities. Um, but with that in, in, in mind, we need to be on the lookout for these uh, techniques, especially around impaired defenses. We focused a lot on this impaired defenses technique. Um, could you give us a little bit more color about the types uh, the types of ways that attackers are, are actually evading our, our controls. What are the sorts of things that they're doing and what controls are they, are they targeting? Um, really today, we see them targeting a lot of controls. Moreover, if I can disable or, or modify a, a control setting, an adversary uh, uh, may want to disable a security tool to avoid possible detection for those malware and defenses. If I can disable a Windows event log, Imagine the damage that could be, right? How we rely on those logs to be part of a correlation effort to right, produce a meaningful alert coming out. I can limit the data, be leveraged, uh, you know, and leverage that. Uh, um, that affects your audit capability and your visibility capability. Maybe I want to disable or modify a firewall. That sounds almost impossible, right? It's not. It happens all the time. It's a sub technique, and we're seeing that on the rise. Um, bypass your controls and limit the network usage would be the goal. Right. Again, make you blind, make you make you complacent, so to speak, because things are just fine in my environment. Maybe I want to disable or modify cloud logs, another sub technique for impaired defenses. Um, uh, if I limit what data is collected uh, um, on their activities, then again, I can avoid detection as an attacker. And you're blind and you're not only that, you have a false sense of confidence and security that everything is OK, when indeed it's not simply because your your logs have been disabled. Maybe I want to use something like safe mode boot, right? Where I am actually booting into safe mode, disabling endpoint defenses, um, starting up Windows operating systems with a limited set of drivers or services or capabilities. I can own the machine at that point. All of these are techniques that are being leveraged today in environments, and they're really hard to understand and defend against unless you're constantly stress testing and have an expected reality or an expected outcome for those security tools. Um, that's why they're using them today, because it, it's not ov uh, overt. It's not something that is easily detected. It's not something that um, um, defender teams would, would quickly realize. And that means more dwell time for the attacker, more success for the um, objectives that they're trying to accomplish. 
So I would certainly um, implore people to, to really dive into um, the impaired defenses um, technique in MITRE. Look at the red report as well. Uh, and these are techniques that we need to be concerned about and cognizant of and stress testing against to make sure that they're not happening in our environment. John, what do you put this down to, this growth in the use of impaired defenses? Is it because, say, security controls are getting better, so adversaries are therefore taking the easy option in, in taking them out? Is that the main reason? Are there other reasons? What, what do you put it down to? Yeah, so when I hang out with you know pen testers, red teamer type people, uh, the one thing I do consistently hear is EDR is one of the things that is a constant thorn in their side. Uh, it has significantly raised the bar on visibility uh, and raised the bar on, on what attacker skill has to be to bypass it and, and get around it. And so if you're looking at this from an attacker perspective, um, what is the thing that is most likely in their way and most likely to get them caught? Some of these endpoint controls, whether it's EDR or really anything right on the endpoint, uh, visibility and all those sorts of things. And so for them, it's going to be the best bang for the buck, right? If, right? if they can figure out how to get around those things, uh, it's just a simple case of prioritization. The tactics exist. Uh, the commands sometimes are, you know, built into the operating system to try to weave around these things and get things done maybe without malware. Um, there's plenty of ways that they can potentially bypass. Uh, you know, if you read some of the reports that have come out here, I, I know we have a very international audience, which is awesome, by the way. I see people from around the world in the chat. Uh, there was a report that came out from the U.S. government about the Volt Typhoon attacks recently. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those were all about, you know, avoiding endpoint controls. And the way that they were doing some of that was living off the land, modifying, you know, the, the defensive capabilities that were there, and also using legitimate accounts. And all of these things just make it much more difficult for us to see them and ensures that they can at least get to that next stage of their attack. So, you know, Short story, I think it's a simple case of prioritization for them. They have to focus there because it's their biggest pain point and it's going to be probably one of the most effective things they can do right now to be able to continue and not get caught. And when you think about it, just to add on to that, Simon, if you don't mind, the door's wide open. If I can accomplish impairing your EDR, for example, what a significant win for an attacker. Um, the chances of you detecting that quickly, quickly enough before significant damage is done is minimal. And we've seen that over and over and over. So you stop and think about from an attacker's perspective, that's where the money is. That's where the biggest bang for your buck is. And if I can accomplish that goal, I'm probably in for months right before it's actually realized. Yeah. And I see a question in the chat. Uh, if AV and EDR is disabled, could this be seen on a management console? The answer is it depends. <laughs> it depends on the management console. It depends on the software. It depends how the endpoint had that EDR agent killed. Uh, certainly there are ways around it. And if you look at some of the public uh, incident reports out there, there's a lot of them that have a line item that say attacker got access on the machine. EDR didn't notice it. EDR is killed. Attacker continues on. And conceivably, that didn't light up any lights on that particular organization's console because they were able to continue on with the attack. So uh, certainly in, in some cases, at least, it is possible to do that silently. So EDR, um, it's increased the potential for security teams to detect more of these types of techniques. But as we know, and I think we touched on this at the beginning, the MITRE attack framework is very big. There's lots of techniques and lots of sub techniques. So how valuable is it for reports like the red report that can help shine a light on the techniques that adversaries are using most um, commonly? I mean, I would say that's one of the most important things an offender can know. Uh, I'm always preaching, you have limited time, you have limited budget, and you have to figure out where to spend that time and budget to get in the way of the most impactful attacks. There's a whole spectrum of attacks of things that are just kind of an irritation towards things that will land you in the news and cost you millions, billions of dollars, you know, enormous amounts of damage. And the most efficient thing a security team can do is try to understand who their attackers are, what the tactics and techniques those specific attackers use against organizations specifically like them, and then try to get in the way of those things. And so when we get these intelligence reports saying ransomware groups and other kinds of malware are doing these specific things, that you know, conversely tells defenders, this is where you should be spending your time. If you wanna spend one day working on something and make a rapid improvement, right there, right? Uh, that's exactly what these surveys are, are best uh, used for as a directive for helping us uh, save our money and time and resources and be efficient at the job. Defenders need all the help we can get. 
right? Let's let's be honest, right? We're outnumbered, we're outmanned. Um, there's not an infinite supply of time. There's not an infinite supply of dollars or resources. So this threat intelligence is critical. Where do I focus my limited time? What's the biggest bang for my buck? What can I ensure that if I have correct, I'm minimizing my exposure level, right? I'm minimizing the risk associated to that exposure. And that's the goal, reduce risk, get the biggest bang for the buck out of the time that we have invested into the tools and into the actual practice. And then knowing exactly what your adversary is doing, practicing your craft, making sure that you're ready for game day. That's very important. We can stick our finger up in the air and hope and, and wish and guess at what is happening, but leveraging what is going on in the industry and then practicing and stress testing that is critical. The the Pickers Red Report, it makes a number of recommendations to help security teams um, keep pace um, with some of the malware and techniques that, that we're seeing now. And, and these range, as you can see on screen, from use of behavioral analytics and machine learning right through to, to validation and, and um enhancing enhancing broad a little bit more about how in your opinion behavioral analytics and ai can be used to help better um, detect some of the behaviors we've been talking about simon i'm sorry you broke up a little bit was that for john or for myself sir oh yeah um for, for john please do you want me to repeat the question oh yeah sorry it was breaking up for me as well no yeah. uh so oh. you know uh, yeah, sure. Go go ahead and repeat it because maybe the audience missed it as well. Yeah, sorry. I was just focusing on, on the first recommendation around the use of behavioral analytics and, and machine learning. And I was just interested to hear from you um, how valuable um, you think this is to be able to help detect some of the techniques that we've been talking about. Yeah, uh, great question. So this is one of those things that I think fits in very well in the realm of threat hunting. Uh, there's kind of two different modes of detection, right? There's reactive detection, and then there's kind of proactive detection. Reactive detection being those pre-existing analytics and rules and things that you know, if I see this hash, if I see this domain name, that stuff is absolutely bad. But there's a lot of things, zero days and the like, that we don't know what it looks like. And so the only evidence we might see is that maybe there is a single machine or a single user that's doing something that they've never done before or contacted a machine on the network that it's never contacted before. And maybe you will catch that by doing some manual log review with threat hunting. And a lot of times we can do that and that's awesome. And every SOC should try to do that. But when we can bolster the ability to look at that kind of data at scale with something like machine uh, learning and AI and these advanced kind of behavioral analytics that can look at maybe hundreds of thousands of machines and say, these are the anomalies you should be paying attention to. Uh, I think that's where the most important kind of use of this comes in is uh, using it to detect uh, anomalies that you can qualify as likely attacks that you did not have a pre-existing signature for. So yeah, very, very, very important stuff. Crit, um, it's probably fair to say that SOC teams are probably using more types of security controls than ever and, lever and starting to, to leverage a lot of these behavioral analytics tools. But we know that it's not just a question of having the right controls in place, is it? it it's about how you use them and how you get the best out of them. Absolutely correct. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it's about tuning of your tools, understanding that log flow, understanding the parsing, coalescing, correlating into a meaningful alert coming out of a SIM. You know, that's not easy. Uh, I, I, I used to have a t-shirt that said security is hard. Well, it is hard. There's a, it's complex. There's a lot that goes into it. How do I know it's all working correctly? I, I may have had it engineered that way day one, but how am I constantly checking that, right? How do I know, for example, that logs are making it from my endpoint to my SIM, that, that, that they're being coalesced and correlated meaningfully and a, an alert that comes out is actually actionable. It's meaningful, it's timely, it's relevant. Um, these are critical uh, um, issues because we have to do almost everything correct on the defender side. It's the age old story we've heard, right? We have to be right every time. They only have to be right one time. The idea is keeping up with my tools and how they're tuned and how they're architected. 
and ensuring that they're working as expected. Because one anomaly, we've just been talking about impaired defenses, one anomaly, one kink in that chain, we have a problem from a defender's perspective. We may not have the right visibility at the right time we need. We may miss persistence in our environment. We may miss credential uh, privileged escalation. So that, that's critical that we understand how they're architected. And, and validation really plays a key part in that practicing your craft, understanding how your tools work and respond on a normal basis, and then understanding those anomalies when they're not uh, um, reporting or responding correctly. So it's about being close to the technology, understanding how it's configured, and then challenging it on an ongoing basis. So I know when there's a, an environmental drift. I know when there's a shift from a known state to an unknown state. And that's really one of the major problems we have today in cybersecurity is understanding when and if that change happens in our environment. John, um, perhaps you could take a moment to talk to us about some of the challenges organizations face keeping security controls optimized. We know that prevention and detection engineering tend to come up quite a lot when we talk with our customers. It's, it's definitely a pain point. Yeah. Uh, a couple different problems, really. Um, the I think baseline issue for a lot of SOC teams is a solid source of threat intelligence, like telling them what to look out for in the first place. Right. Uh, having a threat intelligence platform that helps them organize the things they're actually seeing. Uh, so I, I teach about threat intelligence platforms and how should they work into a, a SOC in, in terms of process. And at one point in class, I, every time I teach, I say, raise your hand if you have a dedicated threat intelligence platform of some sort. And I would say it's about 50-50, which tells me a lot of teams are simply just collecting a bunch of indicators and maybe can't even connect mm -hmm. the dots on this is a group maybe I've seen before because it's just a bunch of independent seeming events across time, let alone someone pointing out like these are the ones that you should prioritize and pay attention to. So one of the issues is just where do I focus my time? Then from there, uh, I think another problem is having the expertise to be able to do it. Uh, detection engineering is certainly not easy. There's a lot of different languages that you might need to write uh, detections for, whether you're writing snort alerts or Yara signatures or KQL searches in Azure Sentinel, right? There's syntax after syntax after syntax. And it's difficult to be kind of a, a master in all of those things. So getting the right person or at least one person for each of those can be another challenge. And then just fitting it into the schedule, right? There's always a fire in the sock, right? Wow. Uh, you can yeah. constantly be sucked into a whirlwind of activity somewhere. And detection engineering, unless it's a very dire situation, is usually one of those things where it's like, I have an idea for a great rule to write. I'm going to put it somewhere. I intend to write it, but maybe never get back around to it unless it's something that's really uh, high importance right from the start. And so just creating some kind of system for a backlog for rule writing, uh, if people don't have that, they may forget those ideas and then the rule never gets written. So there's a whole lot of things that can, uh, can get in the way. And then, you know, again, just having the technology to write the, the rules you need to have. Uh, there's a lot of different things that could potentially be an issue there. Crit, John was talking there about threat intelligence. Um, threat intelligence and actionable threat intelligence are, are different things, aren't they? Totally. Two totally different things. I mean, I can take threat intelligence all day long. When you think about the nature of threat intelligence, typically it's very reactive. It sits in my EDR, sits in my SIM. Maybe I'm just consuming it and reading it. To take action on it is a whole different level that changes the mindset and changes the capabilities needed. Um, I, I like to view it as really practicing my craft. I really do. You wouldn't expect a professional sports team to show up on game day and win the game if they weren't practicing. Really the same is required for cybersecurity teams today. We can read all of the threat intelligence we want. We can ingest that into an EDR or SIM, but how do we make it actionable? How do we turn that into a proactive capability? Wow, there's a new technique or capability. I would love to see how my tools could defend against that before I'm attacked. What a concept, right? Practicing our craft, being ready for game day. Uh, that's really the core value uh, of validation and why I think it's so important. We know all these new techniques are out. We see a rise in hunter killer malware. How do I know that I am set up to defend against these techniques? That I have the right tools in place, that they're tuned appropriately. John just alluded to the fact that detection engineering alone is complex. Now we've in all of that information from a firewall to endpoint tools to other tools. 
weaving that into a sim and alert and logging, how do we know that that's consistently working as we expect? <clears throat> how do we know when a log source potentially has changed for a sim rule, causing that rule to go stale or not fire? All of these things are complicated. Back to we have to be right almost every time and not only correct, but we have to ensure that what we've architected continually ma is maintained and is working as expected. And then more importantly, we can tune that against new techniques, new pieces of malware, new attacker groups. Threat intelligence is critical to that because I don't have much time. I don't have unlimited resources like the attacker. So I need to know what is important to my organization, what is important to my vertical, and then translate that into what attacks are they using, and then be able to run those in production environments before they're used against my environment. So I have a chance to defend or course correct if something is not right in my environment. Um, it's critical to know what our capabilities are, to have an expected outcome of reliable detection and mitigation of attacks in the wild. Um, John, Crip there started talking about security validation, and I really want to pick this up. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the recommendations um, of the Red Report. It's obviously a topic that's very close to our own heart at, at, at Apicus. Um, and we, you know, honestly believe in, in the role of validation to help assess your security posture, the effectiveness of your security controls, to identify attack paths in your, in your environment. Um, on the subject of security controls again, do you think security teams in general are almost too trusting of the controls that they use? Good question. Yeah, uh, I think a lot of them are <laughs> because we continuously see uh, teams get caught by surprise by all of these defense evasion tactics. Um, and, and, you know, security control validation is one of the most important pieces of hoping uh, and, and building a, a structure around making sure that doesn't happen to you. Uh, you know, everyone's environment is constantly changing. You're in a maybe a multi-cloud kind of situation where your endpoints are being updated with their operating systems. You got Mac, you got Linux, uh, you know, you got Windows, all sorts of stuff all over the environment in various forms and fashions, constantly changing what it does, what software is running. And any of that could break really anything, right? Uh, and then you bring in the cloud, right? And that's a whole different ball of wax. So um, with a constantly shifting environment, it's the same kind of mindset you would apply to, you know, your home smoke detector, right? It's like it's sitting there, the security controls are there, you assume they're going to work. But every once in a while, like on the smoke detector, you got to hit the test button, right? And it's like, is this thing really going to go off? Maybe you burn right. some toast by accident. I did that two days ago. And I was like, oh, there's my smoke detector check, right? <laughs> it's the same sort of thing with security control validation. Um, if you haven't tested these and tested things recently, then we probably should, at least if you don't, have a lingering question in your head, is that thing still going to go off? And that's a question that exists for every single analytic, every single data right. source in your entire environment. It's not just one big question. It's thousands of individual questions on each one of those things. So, uh, you know, I've, I've seen this happen to a lot of teams. And uh, yeah, we need to trust but verify. Crit, talk to us about the things at a detection level that we should be validating. Um, uh, <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good question, Simon. Um, uh, just to back up and take a, a couple of steps back, validating is, is a critical component. It's a foundational layer to understanding what we have. So testing detection controls, the testing detection capabilities, testing prevention capabilities is also critical. I would also add to that 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 it's very important on the visibility side. We've talked a lot about SOC SIM teams today, not only testing for detections that are there, but are we, are we alerting as we should? Are we logging as we should be? We often think about the prevention tool itself, my detection capability, my EDR, my firewall, but what's just as critical are detection analytics, the, 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 the visibility right side of the house. Are logs flowing as they should be or have network teams drop those packets on the floor? Are they being parsed and coalesced as they should be in a sim? So not only is it important to detest those detection capabilities, it's very important to test all capabilities in your environment. You know, I like to use uh, analogies, obviously, but we, we buy a new car, we change the oil regularly. 
We do maintenance on that car because we want that car to run long term, run at top peak performance and last as long as it can get the most money out of that vehicle. Yet we don't do the same thing with our cybersecurity stack. We, we just don't stress test enough. We don't do the maintenance and repair that's needed to understand how change has affected our environment. Our constant enemy not only is the attacker, but change. We can be good on day one, day 30. A lot of things have happened, whether it's M&A acquisitions, whether it's segmentation, whether it's new employees, new analysts, uh, updates to tools. We've seen this before as well. Do those changes affect my posture? It's a simple question. We can't uh, answer that definitively because we're not practicing. We're not doing the maintenance and changing the oil on the cybersecurity stack. What are those changes representing to our posture? We know that the tools were purchased in a certain way and architected a certain way to achieve a goal. Are we still achieving that goal? Are we still, does that goal need to be modified based on threat intelligence we've received? And how do we modify it and know that it's correct before the attacker uses it against us? So I think a foundational component for every size business is challenging their controls, stress testing them, making sure before game day, right, that I'm still able or for the first time have the ability to block, detect, log, and alert. It's critical to our outcomes of what we're expecting from our cybersecurity stack. So it's important to test detection tools. Clearly, it's important to test, to test prevention tools. It's just as, if not more important, to test detection analytic capabilities from a logging and alerting perspective. And I think, John, you wouldn't disagree with that at all. No, in fact, I wanted to hop onto that analogy because cars is, is one easy understood analogy that pr pretty much everyone kind of inherently understands, right? The, uh, the comparison here is any process needs to have some kind of feedback mechanism to tell you whether that thing is effective or if it's going off the rails, right? If you don't know what's happening after you take some action, you have no control of it, right? So if you think about a car, right, the car's dashboard is telling you, is everything still okay in this car right now? Is the engine overheating? Are you running out of gas? There's all these signals that are updated second by second to tell you whether you're in good operating condition or not. In security controls, a lot of teams install it and they're effectively driving the car without a dashboard, right? And you're saying like, well, I hope it's working right now, but you have That's no right. feedback unless you're doing that validation, right? And it sounds insane, right? You would never drive a car without a dashboard because <laughs> you right. never know what's happening under the hood. The car might catch fire any moment, right? It might run out of gas. And so it's the same thing, right? Any uh, That principle applies whether it's driving cars, making a security team that needs to know what's happening on the network and with its tools. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's where that comes in. Yeah, hope, hope is not a strategy. Right. Yep. Let's prove it. And, and <laughs> I remember the, you know, trust but verify comment Ronald Reagan made in front of the Berlin Wall back in the day. But I really like to flip that around. How about I validate? Then I'll trust you. Let's make mm -hmm. sure that what we have in place is done. Let's ensure that our managed security provider is doing the work they expect. Let's ensure that the uh, um, manufacturer and the partner in my environment is delivering the tools and the, and the policies and, and the capabilities around those tools that they say they can. Let's prove it. Let's quit assuming what our posture is. Let, let's quit assuming because I have the right, the right technology in the right location that that's effective. Uh, I've seen it many times where we have the same set of technology in one organization and the same technology in another organization with wildly different results. How is that possible? A lot of times it's slightly tweaked or tuned default configurations because we're hoping that the tool just does the work, just does the job for me. And we're not there yet in cybersecurity. We'll be there at some point uh, in our lifetime. Today, we're not there. It still takes input from humans. It still takes validation capabilities to ensure nothing has changed. I can configure a tool properly day one. Has anything else changed in my environment that affects that tool's capability and ability to do that level of work? And unfortunately, we see today when we do postmortems on breaches, that's not the expectation. I mean, that's not what actually happens. The expectation doesn't meet reality. Let's marry those two up and make sure that our expectation is reality and what we can do today. Yeah. You mentioned it there, Crit, that that things in security, they change a lot, not just in the threat landscape, yes. there are new attack behaviors, new defense evasion techniques. There's also changes within our own networks that we'll not always have immediate visibility of. 
So how regularly then do you advise that validation um, is conducted? That's a million dollar question. I'm asked that continuously. So, so how often should we do it? Well, uh, that, that's a, a, I can answer that in many ways, but let me kind of summarize it. Let's follow the attacker. And there's new attacks out in the dozens, sometimes daily. And that's daunting. Since uh, the pandemic uh, a couple of years back, we've seen exponential growth in, on the attacker side, an explosion of attacks and, and iterations of attacks. What really works for most of my clients on an ongoing basis is weekly testing. And that sounds like a lot, especially when you think about pen tests, where I do it once a year. Um, pen testing cannot help me stay ahead of the breach today. Pen testing cannot help me stay ahead of the attacker and understand this inevitable change in my environment. What, is, what has changed my posture and capability? What we see that matches the, the, the client's consumption capability um, is weekly testing. It'd be wonderful to test on a daily basis. Very few shops have the capacity to test daily. And, and I think that is some diminishing returns based on the volume of attacks. But using threat intelligence to map out what attacks are important to my organization really helps cut through some of the chaff, if you will, cut through some of the volume and get to what's important to me. John mentioned that earlier on in, in the uh, webcast early on. Um, it's important to understand what's important to me and how to use the limited amount of time that I have for the maximum result. What we see is weekly testing using threat intelligence to help guide us as to what APT groups, ransomware campaigns, techniques, and tactics we should be testing against to ensure that our defense capability is morphing as it needs to, uh, keep staying away from the change that inevitably erodes our capabilities and is on point ready to defend the organization. Weekly works the best in most cases. John, you're, you're a blue teamer, right? How valuable is it to you to have consistent validation insights? You know, not just an insight from a pen test on a, on a quarterly or annual basis, actually regular insights that give you uh, visibility into the effectiveness of, of controls in your environment. Oh, absolutely. Very valuable. Um, you know, in my past experience, uh, using these kind of tools and even doing things like purple teaming and really anything that tests any of our security controls, there's constant surprise, right? If you've ever run one of these, uh, you know, security control validation tools, done a purple te team pen test, there's always that, oh, I thought we had a control that That's should right. have gotten in the way of that. That's and right. every single time you will learn something. And the whole idea of doing this is simulate the attack so you're not learning that that control doesn't cover that thing when an attacker is actually doing it to you. Uh, and so over and over running these kind of things is constantly um, causing the SOC to learn more deeply about their tools, what they can do, what they can't do, false assumptions they may have made about those things. And then it lets them fix those items before an attacker comes and shows you you need to fix them for you. And uh, the other thing about that is, you know, just on the flip side of this, communicating kind of upward, hey, as a SOC, we are getting better. And here are the kinds of things we're finding and the type of work we're putting in to make sure this organization is more safe is another really important piece of this as well. Uh, just aside from the whole, it actually makes defense better. It's something you can tell upper management and show like, hey, we are improving here. Here are the things we've actually done. And these are why these matter to the business and help us catch things more quickly. So yeah, valuable across the board yeah you think about that uh, simon that's it's practical real-time wargaming right how are my tools working we often talk about tools in the security stack but it's just as critical to test people and process it's a three-legged stool i cannot operate my cybersecurity stack and defend my organization without all three pieces being in place so i'd rather find out before a breach where i'm deficient across people, technology, and or process. Maybe my IR process isn't solid. Maybe it doesn't work well. Maybe I haven't practiced it enough. I'd rather find that out pre-breach than post-breach. That's often the bad time to find out, right, when you stop and think about it. So, so practicing is critical. And that's really what we're talking about from a people and process perspective and your technology. If I have my adversary's playbook, let's run it. Let's understand what my adversary can do before game day, before match day before I'm actually having to defend myself in an active breach. It's about becoming a hard target and forcing the attacker to go on down the road. Yeah. 
<clears throat> it's also about speed of reaction to this as well, if I could jump in on that. Um, yes. One of the things uh, that's a mental model, I think, is really useful is thinking about the OODA loop. So OODA, if you haven't kind of seen this before and you want to Google it, uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. Uh, every SOC uh, has to be able to do those four things accurately, but also maybe even more importantly, do them faster than the attacker. If you can't realize there's a problem before they can move on to the next step, no matter how accurately you're doing all of those things, you still can't solve it. So that practice is not only about will it work, but it's how quickly can you react and really, um, you know, it's it, it, using more fire analogies, right? It's like a fire drill. Like, are you going to know what to do when the time comes? Do you know what door to exit? Do you know what incident response playbook and protocol and procedure and all this kind of stuff you're going to be running uh, when these things actually happen to you? Um, you know, those are speed is just as important as as the capability here. It's been a great conversation so far, gents. Um, I'm conscious that there's a little bit over eight minutes before before we have to finish. So at this point, I just want to invite the audience to to add, ask any Q and ask any questions um, to 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 Crit and John. Um, feel free to to type those into the Q and A, and um, I'll go through those in a, in a moment. Um, before we do that, there's just one final question that I want to, to post to you, Crit. Um, a lot of the time, we find that organizations are almost a little bit scared to, to validate more regularly um, because they're not sure what it was would will find. They, they're worried that it's only going to throw them up more problems than they, than they already have. Um, so how does validation actually not just identify problems but help security teams to better better address them? Yeah, it has to be actionable and operational. The last thing I need is just another uh, set of data that goes, gets put on the pile that's not actionable, that I can't actually do something with because I don't have the resources that I need. Validation is critical to that, especially with PICUS, because our goal is to move you to the answer. Not only let you test and understand what the deficiency may be, not only that, what, what your strengths may be. Let's not underestimate that. I've, I've seen over the years, just like customers don't know their weaknesses, they don't know their strengths. So build on those strengths, shore up those deficiencies, become a harder target. It, it's important to test not only on a regular basis, but then to actually take action on those results. It's not enough to know that I'm not blocking or detecting or logging or alerting as expected, but how can that validation tool provide me the operational information that I can consume quickly and effectively to turn that around? to shore up that defense, to start alerting, to start defending, blocking and logging as expected. So I need operational data coming out of a validation platform. I need vendor specific mitigations that quickly, to John's point earlier, it's about speed. Um, I can't have a problem that lingers for a month or two months and expect a, a realistic outcome and, and prevention or increased detection capability from that tool. I need to shore those defenses up when I find a gap and I need to do it quickly. So I need a tool that not only allows me to test quickly and easily in an environment without additional resources, without specific offensive skills in the environment, but I need that platform to feed me information that's operational that I can directly take to a SIM. I can directly take to a firewall or an EDR tool and change that trajectory, change that capability quickly. Um, instead of flipping over the wall and involving other teams, I need answers to the test is what I'm, what I'm talking about. So combination of being able to validate on a regular basis, being fed those answers to the test to shore up those gaps helps me actually practice my craft and become a harder target again before game day, before I'm attacked, before that breach actually happens. That's the key to success not testing alone because testing can just highlight gaps what's the answer to that test how do i shore up that deficiency how do i course correct uh, um, that particular tool or that lack of ability a lot of times customers don't understand the gaps they have in their environment they think their defense in depth is is pretty solid they've covered all of the gaps many times we can uncover gaps in their technology stack capability and let them know that they weren't aware of that and how to close that gap, whether it's from specific vendor mitigations or whether it's you need new technology or a technology to begin with. How do we know what our capabilities are unless we test them? Why are we letting the attacker be the one that tests our environment? And then we react because the constant reacting and responding 
is not proving uh, um, fruitful. It's not pro providing dividends to the organization. So I want to be offensive on my own. I want to know what my deficiencies are, right? We do it in every other BU in an organization, right? Think of manufacturing. They know exactly what they're producing, what they're not producing, and whether they're meeting their goals or not. Why can't we do the same thing in security today? We can. We can test ourselves in production and have those operational answers to infuse into the technology to course correct and become a harder target. I've got a question from uh, Manuel. I'm going to present it on screen now. Um, yeah, I see a bunch of great questions here. I'm excited to kind of. Yeah. We need another hour to fire through. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here we go. So Manuel asks, um, what do you suggest to implement in order to complement EDR capabilities and cover defense evasion techniques? Event log agents are not always a feasible option in large environments with thousands of endpoints, maybe a standalone NDR. Um, I guess this maybe comes back to a point you were making earlier, John, about visibility across network and endpoints. Yes, I, I love talking about this. This actually was the one I was looking at to, to answer first. So great, great selection there and great question. Uh, with endpoint, endpoint visibility is amazing, right? It's, it's very detailed. It gives us a really good clue of what's going on when it works. It is a potentially unreliable observer, right? Anything on an endpoint can be turned off by an endpoint that has been compromised. So uh, what are we going to do as a result of that? We need a more steady source of data that we can trust. And yes, network data is going to be an outstanding backup for that sort of thing, not just as an alternative for EDR and endpoints, but for our infrastructure as well. Uh, I just got back from RSA conference. Uh, Crit was there as well. I got to meet him in person last week. That was a lot of fun. And I saw a lot of people on stage, keynotes, uh, you know, side talks and presentations and just conversations I had with people talking about this rise of infrastructure compromise, like your router and your firewall. Good luck installing an EDR on that. How are you going to know if that's compromised, right? Because it's not going to report it necessarily either, uh, especially if it's, you know, had its logging uh, turned off. So network again, right? Um, people have said, well, oh, everything's encrypted now. I, you know, there's not really any point I'm going to endpoint. Uh, there's still a lot of value in looking at your network and understanding like here's the actual packets going across my wires and where they're going on the internet and without that uh, some of this defense evasion is much easier to do so yes absolutely uh ndr and looking for anomalies on network packets and not just assuming all endpoints are going to cover it uh, that's my suggestion there simon i would add to that as well that uh challenge yourself on a continuous basis against those defense defense evasion techniques understand whether we can block them, detect them, log and alert against these techniques. Do we have the capacity to see these before they actually happen? Let's not just take a reactive approach. Let's take a proactive approach and take these techniques that these attackers are using, challenge our current infrastructure with those techniques, understand what our capabilities are for visibility and blocking and detection. Got another one from uh, Hussein um, who asks, do you think AI will get us better detection mechanisms or do you think AI is just the bubble in the, the cybersecurity uh, area? Yeah, I was looking at this one too. So great second choice. Uh, I see there was another question later, uh, from Abdul as well, kind of along these same lines. In other words, what is AI doing for us? Is it helping uh, blue or red teams more? So again, referencing what I saw at RSA and referencing what I've seen from students in the classroom and organizations I've worked with, uh, AI is certainly helping in the realm of both detection and lifting up, uh, especially newer people in the SOC. So you can get into your SIM and maybe not know how to phrase a search AI. You can use natural language, say, how do I write a Splunk SPL query to find whatever it is I'm looking for? That's great. You can also potentially give it samples of emails, samples of files, and say, hey, I need a Yara signature. I've seen you know, snort signatures, Yara signatures, and other things uh, in the development of those boosted by AI. Is it going to be perfect every time? No, but does it do 90% of the work in a lot of cases? Yeah, it will, right? Uh, it'll certainly help read email and determine whether it's phishing or not, and those kind of things can, can be bolstered by that. But on the red side, uh, to the other kind of question that was very similar to this, yes, attackers are raising the bar as well. They can make phishing email now that is very you know, well-stated, grammatically correct, convincing phishing email. 
Uh, Steve Sims, actually my, my colleague at SANS, he's the offensive ops curriculum lead. He was doing one of the keynote presentations at RSA and talking about what are red teams actually doing with AI right now? And is it outpacing blue teams? And his take was like, well, they're using it to kind of interpret vulnerability reports. They're using it to craft better phishing emails, but we haven't seen a whole lot of effective exploit development with AI yet. So at this point, although it's very early stage, I'm inclined to think blue teams are a little bit ahead of red teams when it comes to this. Uh, obviously, things can change any moment. Uh, we saw the big GPT 4.0 kind of announcement from OpenAI a couple of days ago. You know, all these opportunities are constantly showing up and changing. But right now, I think I'm a little more positive on the blue team aspects of AI than red team. I would agree with John completely. I mean, right now we're seeing AI, just like in our platform, really help analyze, help mitigate, help prioritize information that's really hard to get out in the weeds. It's sometimes difficult to get in and, and find that data that's deep or draw those correlation points. I think AI out of the gate is certainly helping defenders in that arena, understanding the data in front of them, understanding how to prioritize that data, understanding how to mitigate certain situations in a more efficient manner. But let's not kid ourselves, right? AI is certainly going to be helping the attacker moving forward at, a, at an exponential rate. And to this question more fundamentally, I definitely don't think it's a bubble. I think it's a momentous shift in what we're seeing, not only in cybersecurity, but in our daily life. Um, AI is going to change a lot. And I personally think for the better, we always look at the negative side. Our human tension to attendance are, are to look at the negative side of things. But AI is going to be a tremendous asset for us on the offensive side when it comes to cybersecurity and on the positive side of life. I and mean, we're already seeing that make an, a, an immense improvement for our clients, understanding the data, understanding how to mitigate some of these attacks quicker, understanding how to prioritize what's important to me and my organization. So I'm personally very excited about AI and its capabilities for the, for the cybersecurity defensive group. Um, and that will certainly help us keep pace with the attacker that will be leveraging AI as well. We've had some great questions and I'm going to time, find time just for just for one more. Um, this one I'm going to share now is from Issa2, who asks, what role does fileless malware play in circumventing traditional detection methods? And how can SIM and ADR solutions adapt to effectively detect and mitigate this type of threat? Um, so yeah, fileless malware, you won't detect that with just a, a standard AV, will you, John? <coughs> Well, it, again, it's a big, it depends. Uh, traditionally, this was a lot harder for, for AV. Um, sometimes it can catch it, depends on the specific technique used. But, you know, in the past, at least, there was the situation in a lot of cases where it was files that hit disk as a written file or the things that get checked by antivirus. And if it was fileless, it never got checked, right? So if it's something that's being loaded directly into memory, which can be done, if you have an AV or an EDR solution uh, that can look for the API calls that can inject code into a running process or you know, spin off a new thread or child process as something that never actually leverages a file, well, maybe it can catch it. But certainly there's multiple ways of doing that as well. And so, yeah, once you're getting into the world of fileless malware, it is a great defense evasion tactic for attackers to use because it just reduces the chances that one of these things will catch it. So how do they adapt? Well, they adapt by being a vendor that deeply understands the API calls and the things required to use and launch fileless malware and make sure they can get a dependable hook into the operating system uh, to watch for those sorts of things happening. Uh, how can a SIM adapt? Well, the SIM can only get the logs it's receiving, right? So if we have a data source that is capable of watching process by process, maybe what connections are being made and things like that, certainly those signals can be collected and sent to your SIM as long as you have the right detection mechanisms in place. Uh, you know, you can get this stuff done, but it it is something that makes it more difficult for defenders. So it's a case, again, like we've been saying the entire time of, select your tools very carefully and then verify that they will actually cover these things. Critical component, and I agree with you very much. Uh, I would say almost at the foundational level, let's start and understand if what we have in place today can mitigate this type of attack, right? Can mitigate and understand what's happening when a file is malware attack. From there, we know exactly what our capabilities are and exactly what direction to head. That's why validation is so critical and so foundational to the decisions we make. We've been trained in cybersecurity to make decisions and go a different direction based on opinions, hunches, what we see and think from our peers, Gartner, go down the list, right? 
how about starting with what we're actually capable of doing and what we've spent our money on already and then modifying from there to know exactly what gaps need to be filled, building it as we go. Again, another analogy, we never build a house and then come back when we're done retrospectively and have it inspected. We have it inspected as we're building the house. We want to make sure that we're building that home properly. It's on the right foundation. The septic and electrical is done properly, that the walls are being done properly. Why in cybersecurity do we build it and then come back and spot check it? And we find gaps, right? Let's validate as we build. Let's start with what we have today, understanding those gaps, knowing what they are to get to a certain state that we need. And then we know each exact step that we need to follow and what tools uh, need to cover what gaps in, in, in our place. So when we build our cybersecurity home, we're inspecting it as we're building it. When it's done, we know it works as it was built. We know the expectations we have are being met. And then all we have to do is consistently challenge on a regular basis to make sure change has not caused an inevitable security drift or environmental drift in our known posture. Well, gentlemen, um, it's been a fantastic discussion. Uh, I personally have really enjoyed it. Um, I hope our audience have um, as well. If anybody wants to know a little bit more about defense evasion, top attack techniques, uh, read more into the recommendations of the Red Report, then feel free to download it. It's freely accessible from the media tab. Uh, download it, take away, read it in your own leisure. Um, I hope you find it, it really useful. Um, I want to thank uh, Crit uh, and our special guest, John, from, from SANS for, for taking part in today's discussion. I think uh, it's been, been really insightful. Yeah, I've had a ton of fun. Thank you. Could have gone on for another hour on this topic. I think there's a lot that can be consumed, and I think we see that with the questions that we have. So um, please feel free to download the Red Report, and uh, we look forward to any questions you may have subsequently.